Good morning. William Tyndale was born many years after the people in Hebrews 11 are spoken about, but he belongs in that list. He went through some of those same things today. We'll be looking um, a little bit at his influence. It's incredible. And um, in my study on a fresh look at the Bible, uh, when I came to William Tyndale, most of us have heard his name before, Coverdale, Tyndale, Wycliffe. We've heard the name before, but I've asked about six Christians, what do you know? And, and most of us don't know much about him and um, extremely rewarding. I, I hope to, to share a little bit with you. It's not about a Bible character, but it's about a man that I consider a hero for God and one that impacted every life in this room, every life in America, every life in every English-speaking country of the world and a brother in Christ, an incredible man. So before I go on, just a couple of quick things. If um, a lot of times I don't have notes, but if you would ever like the PowerPoint presentation, um, it's just a matter of me emailing it to you and you're welcome to have it just by requesting it. Secondly, there's, there were, I didn't check an hour ago, but I, there are about eight books on the back pew there. Are they still there? Nathan, and, and there's four brand new copies of um, uh, uh, God is Spoken by Arnold Schnabel, a book of evidences, uh, some Bible artwork, clip work, uh, some Bible history books, about eight books or so. If you'd like, just take a look at them. If it's one you'd like to add to your library or read, then, then feel free to take those. They were, they were all extras. <clears throat> so with that, we're going to look at a fresh look at the Bible, continuing our weekly study. And this is about William Tyndale. He's a translator of the English Bible. So it's funny. I, I emailed this and, and um, nothing was overlapping in my PowerPoint, but just sometimes maybe I used an older version of PowerPoint. I don't know, but I can see that there's some flaws here. I apologize ahead of time, but um, <laughs> we'll have to live with it. So, William Tyndale translated uh, the New Testament uh, completely, formally, it was compiled before he ever lived in 300 AD. We had it, we talked about it about three weeks ago. All the books existed, all 27 books in the New Testament existed, but back around three, just after 300 AD, the early church got together and said, let's put these all in one book. But let's make sure we don't get any that don't belong in there. Let's make sure we only include those that are inspired by God. And so they compiled it a little bit after uh, into one volume. They call it the canon um, of, the, of the New Testament, a little after 300 AD. I mentioned before, just want to throw it out again. We have so many manuscripts. We're so sure of the accuracy of the New Testament because just in Greek manuscripts, that was the original language. The books and partial uh, uh, manuscripts, fragments, we, had, we have, as of a few years ago, 5,856 pieces uh, or full books that were uh, written before 350 A.D. We have copies of those, and many more were done. And, and so they just look at them, and they say, do they all agree with each other? If they find one that disagrees, they look at it, and they, oh, that looks like that's a scribal error. It was written years after these other ones, or, but they can figure out, and, and our New Testament is, a, is basically identical to the one uh, just after uh, that was compiled in the first century. The Catholic Church commissioned Jerome uh, in about 382 A.D. to write the whole Bible in Hebrew. Excuse me. Write the whole Bible in Latin from the Hebrew and the Old Testament, the Greek and the New, and he did so. He did so, and it was called the Latin Vulgate. And so it was the only, unfortunately, the Latin Vulgate was the only version available in Europe for nine, basically 900 years. There were the fragments, there were some of the manuscripts, but they were closely guarded by the Catholic Church, held in monasteries and some universities, and the average person couldn't even get access to the Greek versions of it. They only had the Latin 
Vulgate, which was the Bible in Latin, and Latin was dead. No one spoke it anywhere in the world unless you went to school specifically to be a Catholic priest or, or maybe you're from a wealthy family. Um, no one, there was no country that spoke Latin anymore. So Europe, there were, outside of Europe, there were accepted, but in Europe, for 900 years, all they had was the Bible. Nobody could read except for the privileged few that went to university. They made the Bible inaccessible to people like us. Couldn't get a hands on. I, they wouldn't give it to me. They didn't give it to any preacher. You had to become a Catholic priest to learn Latin and to have even access to a copy of it. So the Catholic hierarchy wouldn't allow the Bible in languages people could read. It was against the law. There was no Bible in English or Spanish or German or French. They didn't exist for 900 years. So they made God's word inaccessible to common, normal, God-fearing people or those that wanted to know more. The members of the church, one of the, the, the reasons for this is members of, of God's people, members of the church, if they didn't know what the Bible said, they couldn't hold the leadership accountable. Hey, you're breaking scripture. You're not supposed to do that. And the Bible speaks directly against that. You're not supposed to call any man father, and yet you make us call all the priests father. And anyway, without it being in the hands of the average people, the leadership couldn't be exposed. Uh, I am so sorry. I went through it all. It was working at home. A couple of examples of things the Catholic Church did. Uh, number one, they had indulgences. For instance, they did not teach that God was a loving God, fertile mercy, and looking to save people. They taught he was vindictive and mean and harsh, and, and that even if you were a Christian, a true Christian, and you died, the first place you went to was purgatory. What happened in purgatory, just like hell, except that you had the ability to escape. But in purgatory, you suffered. You were tortured, burning for seven years for every single sin you ever committed. Well, for me, that would be what? In the millions? Falling short of the glory of God? So they taught purgatory. But, but don't worry, listen. All you have to do is become basically a slave to the Catholic Church. All you have to do is pay us enough money and we'll let you escape that. Or if you have loved ones in purgatory suffering, sell your house, sell your farm, you know, become poor and, and we'll allow you to buy them at, not God. You give your money to the church for evil purposes, we'll allow you to buy your way or buy them out of purgatory. It, it was the priests... You know, they weren't allowed to be married, but if they paid the Catholic Church enough money, they were allowed to have a concubine. And I'm just scratching the surface. This isn't new. Things similar to this have happened throughout the history of God's people. These things or similar type evils were happening in the day of Jesus. The evils that the, the, the uh, Jewish leaders committed, they devoured widows' homes, and it was really terrible. So this isn't new. One of the reasons I'm pointing this out is to show you the environment in which William Tyndale lived, that we don't live in yet. It will come around again, most likely. I'm not a prophet, but it always happens, and God's children are persecuted and Bible's taken away and it is happening in the world now, you probably know. China, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, very illegal to own a Bible and you will be punished severely or killed and your organs harvested if they catch you. So these are not new things right here, but I want you to know how privileged we are, how soft we have it uh, in America. So I already said that one, the Dark Ages. So this was called the Dark Ages, and you look it up on Google, there's different definitions, but 
Some say it started with the Latin Vulgate, 400 AD or so, and went into the, you know, 15, 1600s. But I think it's a good title because what they did, what those in charge of religion, formal religion, did was they snuffed out God's light. They hid his word, not all over the world, but in Europe especially, they tried to hide it. There were some that it broke through and got to the light anyway. Don't have a lot of time to talk about that. May mention it a little bit later on. But anyway, the Dark Ages, for a good reason, it's called that. Now, in the 1380s, a Catholic priest by the name of John Wycliffe, he thought every Christian, every believer and non-believer should have access to a Bible they can read and understand. So the Bible, the New Testament, was written in Greek. But he translated the New Testament into English by hand. Every single copy that he and his fellow workers made was handwritten, so very expensive, and very, it took a long time to make the copies. But even so, they were so committed to the work, and he had helpers, that they, they made lots of copies of Wycliffe's English translation from the Latin language. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't as good as, as, as translated from the Greek there was significant resistance from Catholic authorities. No, no, we don't want the people to have the Bible. People in England and Europe had an intense, an intense spiritual hunger for God's word. Much more so than what, as I read, than we have in America today. They wanted to read the Bible for themselves and know what it said. Like Nehemiah's people, remember? Please read to us from the law of Moses. They'd never heard it before. Same idea. Bishop Fitzralf of Arma, quote, I used to think that I had penetrated to the depths of your truth. He's talking to God, but he said it many times. Penetrated to the depths of your truth with the citizens of your heaven until you, the solid truth, shone upon me in your scriptures, scattering the cloud of my error and showing me how I was croaking in the marshes with the toads and the frogs. The toads and the frogs were not Christians. He's referring to the other priests because Tyndale complained. We'll get to him in a moment. As he went to college, he said, he said that to be a priest that was going anywhere, if you went to college, first they gave you eight or nine years of heathen teaching against the Bible. And then their exposition of the Bible was so terrible, so, so distorted like the Jews, some of the Jews did. He says, by the time you got access to read a copy for yourself, it was too late. Most had been, most would-be priests were perverted and disillusioned and misguided. But anyway, this guy is one of the exceptions. I used to think I was doing really good for people until I read the word of God and saw that I was a toad or a frog. But obviously he changed because he valued the word of God. This is a man who when he finally got to look at the Bible, laid aside all the garbage he was taught and looked at the Bible, took a fresh look at the Bible. Praise God for him. And for all of those in here that do the same thing. One opponent of the Bible in the early 1400s. Now, still, Wycliffe's Bible was out now. He published it in the 1300s in English. But one of his opponents of the early Bible in English complained. He said, the pearl of the gospel of Christ gave to the doctors and that that Christ gave to the doctors and clergy of the church was being scattered abroad and trodden underfoot by swine. That's you and me. This was the attitude, prevalent attitude, of the clergy of the Catholic Church, is that regular people were swine. They didn't deserve access to the Word of God, and they couldn't understand it. At least they told their, their parishioners, so they wouldn't try to read it. What a cloud of darkness... Again, there's light coming, but I want you to understand the world William Tyndale and others were born into and what they had to do to overcome it. It was incredible. 
So there's an intense effort by the Catholic leadership to ban all English Bibles because Wycliffe made some. They burned all English Bibles and they burned those who read English Bibles. You get caught with the Bible on you, they burned you. you find, they find one in your home, they burned you. They ask your children, do your parents have a Bible in your home? Oh, no. Hey, do you, do you have one of those neat Bibles in your home? If somehow they discovered the owned Bible, you were burned to death. Not put in prison. It depends on who, who is in charge, but normally burned to death. In 1407, well before Tyndale, 100 years, they, they forbade all Bibles, books, even pamphlets that could be written or read in English or any other language that wasn't Latin, German, French, Spanish, Bulgarian. They forbid them all. The Catholic Church did. No, it cannot be in a language that people speak today, in, in their day. April 4, 1519, Tyndale's a young man now. Six people in England were burned at the stake for teaching their children the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments in English. Six people burned just for doing that. Churches of Christ existed at this time. I didn't know that, Michael. I didn't know the Church of Christ even by that name existed in Europe. I knew it existed in other parts of the world. But an enemy of the church, of God's people, who took pleasure in killing people like us, seekers, he complained that by 1525, and of course they had existed well before that, but he complained that there are these churches of Christ that, that don't believe in infant baptism. They believe in full immersion. Imagine that. They dunk people completely underneath the water as the Bible says. They don't um, acknowledge the authority of the Pope. And he, he has a long list. This is all recorded. Even by this time, they were keeping pretty good records. And so, Churches of Christ existed in England at this time, but they were underground. Many of the worshipers, uh, many of the members worshipped at Catholic Mass as well so that they wouldn't be discovered because everybody was expected to go to church. Where were you, Samuel? We didn't see you one Sunday. Or the one before, the one before. So there were underground churches. The people were called Lollards, kind of a derogatory name, but they were called Lollards, these Christians who believed in Bible authority and not the popes and, and baptism and not infant baptism and on and on and on, called Lollards. Their lives were at stake for not bowing to the authority of the pope. They could find any, any number of reasons to, to um, go after you. So a man named Erasmus, he was a Catholic priest, died a Catholic priest, but he did think that people needed um, to have access to the Bible. So he took, instead of the, the Latin Vulgate, he collected a lot of old manuscripts and compiled a New Testament written in the original language, Greek. Now that didn't help the average Christian who couldn't read Greek either, but Erasmus started something and many were against him. But because he was a good Catholic and acknowledged the authority of the Pope, they didn't, um, they didn't condemn him to death. He, he escaped that. <clears throat> so he, he put the New Testament in Greek in 1516. So you've heard of Martin Luther. Martin Luther, October 31st, 1517. I don't know if he read Erasmus, New Testament, or because he was a new priest and had learned Latin, read the Latin version, but either one would do. He said, this isn't right. The church isn't following the Bible at all. And so you've heard about it, but he, he nailed 95 theses on the door of the church, I believe it was in Wittenberg, saying, these are not right right here. I want a debate. Martin Luther. Now, he and, and Tyndale, you'll see, they, uh, you won't see, but I'll tell you now that they disagreed on a lot of things. Martin Luther was not a restorer of the church. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He wanted to make the Catholic Church better. So he still believed in infant baptism, something completely contrary to scriptures, and many other things. But nonetheless, he started a movement. 
getting back to the scriptures. And so <clears throat> he's at, here's one person against Martin Luther. His name is Ignatius Loyola, who founded the Jesuit priesthood. Um, and I think Loyola University is named after him. But, quote, I will believe that the white object I see is black. If that should be the decision of the high art, high art, high art the big dudes, and the church. If it looks white to me, and my archbishop says it's black, I think it's black. Luther said, a simple layman armed with the scriptures are to be believed above a pope, the head man, or a cardinal, second only to the pope. Without a simple layman armed with the scriptures is not a simple layman armed with the scriptures who's not a priest, we are though, the Bible says, but who's not a clergy, is to be believed above a pope or a cardinal without it. Martin Luther translated the entire Bible into German from the Greek. Into German, the common language, which is very risky. His life was at stake. They wanted to kill him. He did it in 13, 1534, which was after, you'll see, Tyndale. You can read some books that kind of slant things. And say, yeah, Tyndale was heavily influenced by, by Martin Luther. Well, Tyndale looks like was a Christian. Martin Luther did a lot of good, but, but apparently not a Christian by, by his belief set. But if anything, the influence may have gone the other way. There's no evidence they met together, even though Tyndale later moved to Germany, fled to Germany, and they may have met. Um, they had strong doctrinal differences that had to do with salvation. William Tyndale, our hero, my hero anyway, Born around 1494, no record of his infant baptism. They kept good records back then in the churches. No record of it, which kind of implies that his parents, may, who were wealthy because he went to Oxford, implies that his parents may have been lollards who didn't believe in infant baptism, believed in full immersion. We don't know for sure, but just throwing that evidence out there. So William Tyndale was brilliant. He entered Oxford at the age of 12 to 14. We don't know exactly when he was born, but we know when he entered it. It's in the records. 12 to 14 year old entered the most prestigious university, even above Cambridge, in all of England. Brilliant man. Fluent in eight languages. Latin, Greek, Hebrew, English, probably German. Um, I couldn't find the full list, but, but everybody agrees that of the few that I read, fluent in eight, that's, that's incredible. That's a difficult thing to do if you ever studied languages. Fluent, not adequate, fluent. He was a Catholic priest. He went to Oxford, learned Latin, became a Catholic priest. Sworn to never marry and, you know, serve the Pope and all this kind of thing. But because he knew Latin, was able to read the Bible, the Latin Bible, he, like us, took a fresh look at the Word of God. Oh! He knew what he'd been taught for how many years? And he looks at the Bible and says, there are huge differences and there's much evil going on in the Catholic Church, greatly bothered by these gross violations. <clears throat> this is interesting. There was a survey taken, I don't know if, Tyndale was involved in the survey, but a guy named John Stuper um, interviewed 311 priests at Oxford. Remember, these are the, these are the smart guys that are go either teaching or, or studying at Oxford. The smart guys, 311 priests, nine <clears throat> didn't know the Ten Commandments existed. So um, what can you tell me about the, the Ten Commandments? Ten, co ten what? Nine at Oxford didn't know Ten Commandments given by God even existed. 33 didn't know they were in the Bible. Over a tenth of them didn't even know they were in the Bible. Ten couldn't recite the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 and Luke, you know. Um, <clears throat> Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, you can add me to that list. Anyway, <laughs> ten couldn't recite the Lord's Prayer, and, and it's okay. It's not a, memor a prayer to be memorized. It's, it's a prayer, it's a model prayer to show us how to pray. But anyway, 30 didn't know that Jesus said it. They didn't know where it came from. Because they didn't know the Bible. In a congregation or a parish, 
many priests who led the worship services in Latin. How many of you have ever been to a Latin service in a Catholic church? Us older ones, because it changed. When I went and visited Catholic churches in Mexico and the United States, always in Latin, it was against their laws to preach in English. That changed uh, before most of you were born, but, but all their services. And even though they were done in English, I guess they memorized the words because many priests who led the services didn't even know what they were saying. Just making sounds, speaking in tongue. And of course, the people didn't have any, any idea what they were saying because they didn't speak Latin either. And the Catholic Church if you went through the motion of the Lord's Supper that we partake today, thank you, Terry, for your thoughts. If you went through the motion, you eat the wine and drink it. You don't know what the priest's saying, but if you went through the motion and the Lord's Supper was blessed by a priest, you were okay with God. That was good enough. But look what the Bible says. And Tyndale knew this. 1 Corinthians 11, 26, 27, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you know that's what you're supposed to do. Verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body of Jesus, guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. How could they partake in a worthy manner? Did they daydream? Did they think about whatever? But they didn't know what they were doing. And by the way, the phrase... This is my body in Latin is hocus corpus me. Hocus corpus. We get the phrase hocus pocus because they didn't, it was magic. Oh, we're drinking, we're actually eating the physical blood of Jesus. They were told they were. We're actually drinking the literal blood of Jesus. They told that they were. It doesn't matter what I think about or how I live. Hocus pocus. That's where the phrase came from. This is my body. Hocus corpus meum. After graduation from Oxford, and he also went to Cambridge, most authorities agree, but they don't, the records aren't quite as good. Lots of indication, though. He lived with a wealthy English family. Now, here is, by now, the greatest scholar probably in the world or in England. He knew the scriptures flew in all these languages, not Hebrew yet, but, but seven others. Maybe the greatest scholar alive at the day. And he would preach to people outside the building. Tell them about the gospel. Look, God is a loving God. God is full of mercy. He wants you in heaven. There is no purgatory. All this kind of thing. He lived with this wealthy English family as a tutor for their two young children. The greatest scholar in all of, all of Europe, at least? Probably as a, a guise, as a, as a way to work on his first English translation. He tutors the kids a couple hours a day, four hours, whatever, and then works on his translation. We don't know for sure. But he lived with them. And, and um, this family, he began preaching when he had opportunity, whether he's walking around the villages. He's in, this is Gloucester, uh, Wales, near the southwestern part of England. I don't have it pictured, but that's what I read. They would have, these are wealthy people, so they'd have people over for dinner, lots of times Catholic clergy. And so he's a free thinker, a little bit of a maverick, because he loves the Word of God over anything else. And he would engage them in dialogue. Here's the second most famous, do I have it on this? So one of his most famous quotes is this. First, a clergyman, and when they're talking about the Bible and reading English, one of the clergymen at dinner said, we were better to be without God's law than the Pope's. And William shot back, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. A plow boy will know more than you Catholic clergy know of the Bible. Probably his second most famous quote. Now that's words to be killed by. I defy the Pope. They would kill him for just that alone. We ran to England, 
hopefully in time, to ask permission one of the bishops there, Tunsdale, I think his name is, but um, <clears throat> if he could translate the Bible into English. Because the guy he asked was a friend of Erasmus, the guy that put it into Greek, remember? And, and um, the third, I forget now, 1400, 1380s. Can I translate the Bible into English? No. He flees to Germany because his life's in danger. They know he's a threat now. They know he's a big threat. Flees to speculation. Most think, well, he must have met with Luther and had some dialogue because he lived in the same town Luther did for a little while. Anyway, we don't know for sure. No, no records of it. <clears throat> but get this. Maybe the two, two of the most powerful institutions in the world were seeking to, to kill him. The Catholic Church, of course, they dominated every country in Europe. They told kings what to do. And they had spies everywhere looking for this guy, William Tyndale. Hey, you know anybody that's trying to translate the Bible into English? They just, and printing presses were new. Gutenberg had invented them. And there were maybe, I think, a read nine in, in Antwerp where he went once. And, and so they would go to the printers. Hey, you have anybody ask you to do anything in English? Because this is Germany. And they had spies everywhere. And, and yet, they didn't catch them for quite, quite a while. England had spies that sent, they sent, the King, King uh, Henry won Tyndale's head as well. Lots of detail, can't give it to you. Um, <clears throat> there was a large reward for finding Tyndale and kidnapping him, having him kidnapped, I mean, significant sum of money. Tyndale associated with the Lollards, those that we would call Christians, who believe the authority of the scriptures, didn't believe in infant baptism, but true baptism and so forth. He spent time with them. <clears throat> they were in the underground churches. Many were wealthy cloth merchants. So he went to the English house where a lot of the Lollards stayed when they were doing business in, in Germany, called the English house. And it was kind of like um, asylum for anybody from England. The, the Germans would not enter the English house. It was kind of like... Um, what do you call the place today where countries have embassy. the embassies? It was like an embassy. And, and they kept him there for a while in, in one in Antwerp. Um, he, they smuggled Bibles into England. They put him into the cloth bales and clothing and this kind of thing. And, and the Lollards and, and the cloth merchants smuggled English Bibles that Tyndale is printing into England. People bought all that were available. Bibles were burned. People were burned. Tyndale's first complete New Testament was finished in 1526. A lot of it's excitement that I won't bother telling you about it, but they were after him, you know, once in, in a worm or cologne. I remember a spy found out that they were he was having his documents printed by a printer there, Somehow they found out ahead of time, grabbed what documents they could. They didn't get them all and fled upriver to Antwerp, I think it was. And, and they didn't catch him. And he finished, but he lost some documents, so he had to redo them. In 1526, the first English version ever printed, not, not handwritten, but printed by a press like Gutenberg, um, was finished from the Greek. Uh, there were close calls, more editions. He made another one in 19, 1532, I believe it was. The third edition came out the year of his death, 1536. He was 42 years old or something like that. It was so powerful. His ability to translate. He understood vernacular, common language, and and the way to express something that put power into it without violating the scripture, without taking liberties with the scripture. Extreme. One man, ex so accurate. Well, here are a few that you, you've said yourself. He, he came up with the phrase, it's a good translation, but you could word it another way. He said, I am the light of the world, Jesus. So faith comes by hearing. Let this cup pass from me. These are exact translations from Tyndale. God is love. All against Catholic doctrine. From all that we, uh, that Tyndale wrote, his own writing, he wrote other books. He wrote long prefaces in his Bibles, kind of 
explaining things. They were really good. <clears throat> we know that he followed and taught New Testament Christianity. He taught people how to be saved, just like the scriptures teach it. Tyndale lived and died as a Christian, as far as I can tell. I can't put anybody into, into heaven. I can't preach people into heaven. But by his life, a man of real integrity and honor, by his teachings that we can read about, he wrote several books. Tyndale was a Christian, a New Testament Christian. I'm looking forward to meeting him someday and thanking him for bringing the Bible to us much sooner to, to English-speaking people than we would have had without Tyndale. This is, love showing this, this is the cover page of his last edition of the Bible, the one that came out in 1536. This is his cover page. <clears throat> Read the part in the circle. Well, it's kind of hard. I know it's the, the old English, but it says this. Oh, too far. I thought I'd, I, he quotes, Come on, baby. Tyndale quotes, I've got to make it bigger on my screen, from Mark 16, 15 and 16. Here's the only passage he put on his cover page. Go ye into all the world and preach the glad tidings to all creatures. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Whoa. By choosing to translate the Bible into English, Tyndale chose his death sentence. You can read his quotes. He knew his time was limited. His goal was to get out as many Bibles into English as he could before they caught him because there were just too many people looking for him in every town, every city. His death as a martyr was inevitable. He's betrayed by an Englishman, Henry Phillips, while living in Antwerp, Germany. And he filled with an Englishman. He got in trouble because he was an evil man. His father said, hey, I want you to take this to the city, all my money, all my wealth, and, and I'd like you to put it in safekeeping there, a bank, or I don't remember the details. And so Henry Phillips spent it all. He wasted his dad's money, kind of like the prodigal son in Luke 15. Somehow the Catholic clergy found out about it, and they said, Find this guy. We'll make it well worth your while. So he did. He befriended him. He wrote him letters. And, oh, I just can't. Can I help you? And, and oh, you're doing such a worthy work. And a liar through and through. But, but and, hey, let's meet for lunch one of these days. And, and Tindo was cautious, but, but a trusting soul. And, and finally walked outside the embassy, the English house. And from one that I read, there were police right there. Grabbed him. Took him to prison. Horrible place, 16 months, cold, dark. He was strangled to death and then burned at the stake. Strangled first, normally they burned you alive, but because he'd been a priest, they defrocked him, but uh, they, they strangled him first. I'm going to go back just a second. Good at the time. He had a huge impact on the lives of all of us, English-speaking people. English people seeking God. His translation was so accurate and so profound that over 80% of, of King James Bibles today are his exact words. What's that? 400 and some years later, his translation was so good that when they had the committee of 42 or 46 translators who did the King James, they didn't touch 80% of it. It was too good too accurate, too profound, too moving. So 80% even today, and, and over 70% of the Old Testament that he was able to translate into English before they killed him. William Tyndale, he fought against impossible odds. Can't believe it took them, the world, that long. Thomas More, his arch enemy, who liked to burn people to death. Thomas More, who's very, maybe the second most powerful man in, in a Catholic and a, and a second most powerful man in England, said, he seemed to be everywhere, because his Bibles were everywhere. He seemed to be everywhere, but nowhere. They looked for him from 1525 or so to 1536. Lots of Bibles out there. 
His love for God and his, for souls made it possible to read a Bible in our language. He worked five days a week. When I say worked, he translated five days a week. On the sixth day, even though his life's in danger, he would walk through the city, wherever he was, Cologne, Worm, or Antwerp. He'd walk through the city looking for poor people. He was poor himself. He finally got a sipping from some of the cloth men, but he had no money until he sold the books, and then he put the money back into books. He would look for poor people and help them with food or financially, and he'd preach to them because he loved souls. On the sixth day, a seventh day, I can't remember what I read, but I think he just worshipped and, and um, with Christians and that kind of thing. I don't remember what he did on the seventh day. <clears throat> I said that he fought against impossible odds, but the truth is he didn't. The odds weren't impossible, but they were the fulfillment of what Jesus spoke in Matthew 13, 31. He says, though heaven and earth pass away, but my words will not pass away. It's a promise from God, so that's not impossible odds. It's crazy that he was able to survive 11 years without getting caught <clears throat> because that's the hand of God was with him. There's a promise here that God's words, even in England, would not pass away. Move this over. So a couple of things. He was allowed, I don't know if he's allowed or just yelled it out, but when they were about to put him to death, his last words were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. King Henry was against him. Open the eyes of the king of England. God heard his prayer. In less than two years, King Henry made it legal to publish, own, and read a Bible in English. Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. And God did. All because this man, William Tyndale, took a fresh look at the Bible. Wow, the Bible says this. I'm being taught this. I'm going with the word of God. So he influenced all of us in a very significant way. God heard his prayers because the people of England and all over Europe were hungry for the, for the word of God. And God fed them. Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God wants to be sought out. God wants us, people everywhere, to seek him. Many of you have, and many of you walk with him now, but there's somebody here that's hungry for truth, hungry for a relationship with God is seeking God right now. What a great time to find him because he knows where you are. He wants you to come to him. We're going to stand and sing the song of invitation. Please stand. If you have a spiritual need, prayer to the congregation, would like to become a Christian today, let me know that as you walk forward and as we sing.